Holy Father, we thank you for blessing us uh, with this wonderful time of worship and studying of you, Lord, this, uh, this rightly dividing of the word and our pursuit. Our desire is to see to it that what we give to others is what you have given unto us. As you said, it is a blessing to have the truth, you know. Uh, and so this blessing and this spiritual element is what we look forward to sharing, Lord God, for as you said, it is our blessing that as we are freely re received, we are to freely give. And that's what we will do. And uh, we know that you'll take care of the rest. So thank you and bless your name. All righty. All right. God bless. And Jesus is our salvation. Of course, we know and we thank him for that. And we started talking about grace and the law on last week. So if we can go back to that scripture in Ephesians chapter 2. So uh, we uh, kind of closed out that conversation that we were having when we are prepared for kingdom out of Ephesians chapter 4, having to do with the fivefold ministries and their function and in the building up of the body of Christ and uh, uh, edifying, as it were, and uh, then uh, allowing for the uh, maturing, the maturation of the body of Christ to transpire. Uh, we're looking at grace and the law. And what we want to do here, we want to make sure that we're understanding how God has given us this grace and how it is, uh, how it operates in in not conflict, but within co in concert with the law. So we will eventually get it to that point, if the Lord's will. So we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter two, and verse eight and uh, through ten, and uh, we'll start with that because that will be our kind of our theme in this, so we wanted to go there. So if you could turn your Bibles there, and I'm just going to go ahead and start with you. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God. Uh, for, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's kind of our foundational text for this uh, study, you know. Uh, and the, the, root, the roots of this for us to understand is that, that God has used grace and the usage of the grace uh, was to our benefit. So uh, if we were to start thinking about grace, we think about what God has done to allow us to receive it. The first element of us of this we talked about a bit already last week is that grace is a gift. All right. We talked the fact that, the, that God gave us the grace when he gave us his son uh he gave us the gift we didn't have to climb a mountain we didn't have to cross a river we didn't have to slay a dragon but it was a gift from god this grace that we receive so that central that central principle is in our thinking and the reason for this is to function as a method to provide us a path to our salvation it is a gift of salvation to believers a gift in order to provide a methodology in which uh, believers can be saved that's where that's where we come to this reality believers now one note i want to say believers uh really don't mean like as some people su uh, kind of suppose that believers mean people that uh will agree in the existence of god that's not a believer that is someone who is cognizant or aware of a god a believer is a follower uh, an active follower. Belief is the word pistil in the Greek. Pistil. Pistil. And that, uh, that, that word means actively believing. Actively moving, living by this belief. What belief is it? The belief that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God's, God has come in the flesh and that he died. Went to the cross at Calvary and paid the price for our sins and was raised on the third day from the grave and came back upon the earth. So this is what our core and foundational belief is. And that's what we are actively believing in. That's what we're 
actively believing in. So that's what that word Christel means. And the word faith uh, itself comes from the same root as pistis, or pistis. And that word means the noun. The one was a verb, active believing, actively living, actively trusting, actively hoping and, and building your life around God and the kingdom. And the second word faith, meaning that this is the this is what this is the thing you are relying upon and walking uh walking with that's the noun this believing that's faith this this believing is the thing you're actively doing with the other word okay hope that may hopefully that makes uh some sense for you all right and so uh, we have to understand that God has given us life, and in that giving us life, He He did it from the fact that He is life. We talked about that as well. That you know, I am the resurrection and the life. When He was talking to Martha about Lazarus in John chapter eleven, I am the resurrection and the life. The life comes from me. And then we discussed it from John chapter one a bit as well. So I won't go through all those, but I want to say this today: God's grace that we're talking about, this gift. Grace is a gift. Grace is a gift. It's something you don't deserve. It's something you haven't earned. It is a gift to you. All right. Uh, brought a measure of faith. Grace brought a measure, a certain amount of faith. Grace brought a measure of faith. Now, when we read the scripture, we see, for by grace are you saved. Let's go back for just a minute, okay? For by grace are you saved through faith. The grace is the gift. And it, and it comes to you, it becomes a active benefit on your part because or through the fact that you have faith, faith, pistis. You have this thing called faith, all right? And you're using it. That's part of the, the, imp the impress impression here is that you're using it, okay? And that not, not of yourselves, you didn't get the gift, not that you did it yourselves, but after the colon in verse 8, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. Anybody who receives salvation receives it because God gave the gift. That's core. You got to recognize that God uh, well, gave the gift. I think we, we dropped off the line. We're going to just go back and try to call it back in real quick. See what's going on here with our line. See if we can't get this to work right. I don't know if someone drove past us or something, but we're going to come right on back on. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go here. I think we're back on. It's Pastor Gordon back on, I think. Uh, I, I, my phone disappeared for some reason. You guys can hear me, I hope. Okay, I'm not sure what that was. But uh, anyway, uh, we're, uh, we're going to go on. Maybe there's something with signaling or whatever. But anyway, we'll move on forward. So we have to remember that key to this statement in verse 8, what we were saying here is that that it is not of yourself, it is the gift of God. That's where the focus that we were on. The gift means that you didn't have anything to do with it. It was just provided to you. And the fact that you chose, that you have within you, this willingness to hear God, this willingness to trust and have faith in God, pistil, this, this active thing is a gift of God. You didn't make your own faith. It is a gift of God. Lest any man should boast. Uh, I think somebody's still on, uh, not on, on, uh, on your uh, mute. So if you're not on mute, please put your mute on. Okay. Now the next part is what we're saying to you is that grace brought a measure of faith. Then the grace is what brought the faith that you're operating with. I'm saying that, but I'm going to give you a text about that. So let's go look at this Romans chapter 12, verse 3. So if you can turn with me to Romans 12, 3. And we'll try to make up a little of that time. All right. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man 
man or woman, the measure of faith. That's the key. This grace you are giving you is not something that you should be pompous about. This grace shouldn't be something you walk around saying, say, I'm of the upper class or I'm the chosen class. I'm the elect, you know, and you people are the, you know, you other people are the the commoners, you know. That should not be the mindset of a believer ever. Humility is a sign of actually the Holy Spirit being in you, having the temperance and humility and meekness of, of Christ. But it's not for you to brag. It's not that any man should think more highly of himself than he ought. That's what that text says in Ephesians, lest any man should boast. Rather, the reason why you have this grace is because God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And that measure of faith can, of course, go back to the tie-in in Ephesians chapter 4, where he talks about uh, what the church is supposed to actually become, right? And and Ephesians chapter 4 and where we had our lesson about the uh, what we were discussing uh, that we are made we're prepared for kingdom and we're, we happen to be dealing with the fivefold ministries application there of preparing us and in verse thirteen of chapter four of Ephesians he says till we come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect but that is matured and perfected man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the measure that God has has determined that is what you need to have, God has given you that measure of faith for you to be able to walk in him and talk in him. And it's a gift. So we don't have any reason, no room to, we have no room to brag at all. The grace brought a measure of faith to us, lest any man should boast. The function of this then is to bring us to the place to complete the works of God. This is the danger that can happen uh, if uh, you get caught up in the law and you think, uh, it's to me and what I've done and my um, proof of uh, righteousness that I am actually working on. It's not a, not at all that case. Not not all the case. The bottom line here is that God has prepared you for a purpose and a function. The purpose of the grace was to give you this access to salvation so that you could do what? Go back to Ephesians chapter 2 again. So we'll go back there and let's see. He says, we are his workmanship. Let me give you a second to go there, back to Ephesians 2, and I'm turning also. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Created in Christ Jesus. Remember, how are we made? We're made in him. Born again, born above. You must be born uh, again. Nicodemus' conversation in John chapter 3. You've got to be not born of the flesh that is created in the natural, which you were originally born in. We were all originally uh, come from our mothers, you know, from the the, the, the uh, connection of father and mother. But he says, what we need to be born of is God's spirit. And that is of Jesus Christ. So this is where he uses this, t- this language here. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now, not just of our mother and father, but our, our new creation, as, we, as a, uh, we sometimes hear from Ephesians chapter, not sorry, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we are a new creature. creature. Uh, we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works unto good works. The calling of God is for us to be able to perform good works. So some people say, well, that means works counts. No, get it right. Yeah, works do count, but understand, the works that we do are only the result of the faith that we have because of the grace of God that allowed us to have this faith. So is God providing the grace is God providing the faith? And now, he says, now let's see you performing good works. Created in Christ Jesus, right, unto or for the purpose of what? Good works. Godly works. Not just good to men, but godly works. This is what he's doing. That's the function that he's actually using and bringing us 
too. That's the call for us. Now, the danger that can come in there is that people get caught up in themselves and start to think, wow, I do pretty good. I'm pretty righteous. I follow the law pretty good. And it's quite dangerous. But I would say to you that that is so dangerous that it'll lead you down the wrong path. It'll cause you to think somehow within yourself, you have done something righteous. All right. A good example would be found in the book of Luke. So let's go to Luke chapter 18. And this is a case where we will see a discussion uh, of the Pharisee and the publican. And they both went to the temple to pray. So Luke chapter 18, they're going to temple, right? And they're going to pray. And we'll look at verse number nine. And Jesus gives this example. This is an example, by the way. This is a parable. So it's not an actual account. It's a parable Jesus is giving. All right. He said, and he spake this parable unto us unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. That's verse 9. So before you even go forth, the premise slash context of this whole parable is that Jesus takes note that the people who are around him are proud. They're arrogant. They think a lot of themselves and they despise other people. So think about that. Then, you, then look what Jesus says to these people. Two men went up into the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Publican meaning a tax collector. That is a very evil job in the view of the Jews at the time, having come after the time of the exile where they were in uh, in uh, captivity in Babylon, and then they were under the Persian government, then they were under the Greek Empire government all those years, and finally in the last hundred years or so before Jesus, they finally, they're, they're, uh, within that last hundred years, they're now under the Roman Empire. In either case, the tax collectors are taking money from the regular people and giving it to the Roman Empire leadership. And maybe the, the local Jewish leadership getting a little cut also. But that's what's happening. So they hate the they hate the publicans. They think very low of the publicans. While the Pharisees, those who were a part of the separatist movement, those who are part of the fight back movement to help uh free them from the bondage of these various empires and also to be, in their view, to come back into right standing with God through understanding the law. They are the competition. All right. So this is the competition. I am not understanding why we just got cut off again. I'm on the call back again. This is my second call. It must be this location that is not a good location. Uh, uh, we're going to hold for a second before we keep going and then we'll continue. And type in our little password here. All right, I'm back again. Pastor Gordon, I don't know. I must have been in a bad spot here. I do apologize uh, to you guys, and we're still running. We are still running the video, so it doesn't matter. You you haven't you won't miss anything that we said. Uh, but I'm going to continue from right here. So uh, what we see is the Pharisees, who were the purveyors, and they were really the keepers of the law, and had become the teachers of the law, thought pretty highly of themselves. All right. Now, verse 11 in uh, Luke 18, the, uh, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, uh, thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican slash tax collector. All right. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So the, the Pharisee has already made his case to God. And when he makes his case to God, he 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 uh, he notates all of his great accomplishments toward God that God should take notice of. OK, this is telling you some about the pride that he's operating in at this point. All right. The next one in verse 13, the publican standing far off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful unto me, to me, a sinner. So one is telling God about all his accomplishments, bragging and so forth. And the other is saying, I don't even want to get close to the temple. 
but I just want to be here where you know I'm here, God. And hitting his own self on the chest, knowing how much he's done, that he is a sinner and that he needs God's help. He needs mercy. And that's what he's praying. Lord, please have mercy on me. Then Jesus gives a, a, a closing remark on this in verse 14. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. All right. So what we got here is clearly the oh, tale of two cities or two different viewpoints. You know, we have the proud and pious stance versus the beating his chest uh, stance. You know, wh which one should you be? Where should we fall, fall in this category? Sure, we want to study the scripture. Sure, we want to obey God's word. Hopefully, we've done things that, as God has taught and, and and led us to do. Meaning that we have we're we're carrying out that verse ten of Ephesians chapter two on two good works. That's why He did what He did. That's why He made us so that we would be able to bring forth righteousness. We would be able to share and show others morality and correctness. Right. However, he never meant for us to fall off into the mindset of pridefulness. That is not the intention of the grace that God has given us and say, well, see, I'm saved. I'm holy. You people, you're not worthy. You know, that's never that's never been the intention of God. But rather, we should be just simply grateful that today that while it's called today, we can call on the name of the Lord and that we are acceptable in his sight and pray that you are acceptable in his in his sight ought to be the mindset of the believer every time. Um, so the pride should never, that comes from saying, I've carried the law out perfectly. I did this, I did that, as the Pharisee did include in his prayer, knowing the legalities and their loopholes and so forth. This should never it will never make someone righteous. I hear some noise, somebody. I'm not sure somebody's not on your on your uh, mute. But uh, it, sh it does not make us righteous. And it will never make us righteous. But a broken and contrite heart. And that's the last thing we'll just talk about on this real quick. A broken and contrite heart uh, thou will not despise. What does that mean? Isaiah, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms chapter 51, David's Psalm. After the death of his son, uh, through Beth, the first son of through Bathsheba, in verse 17, and he says, "Psalm, um, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, Thou will not despise." This is the, the last part I'm going to say about this today. Is this so? What David shares with us after his own failure, and it's clearly error, is he recognizes that. No matter what I do, God, not as far as works go, uh, if I bring 20 cows and three 300 rams and fatted rams or whatever, and I slay them all at the offering table after I took this man's wife, Bathsheba, which we know that story, and uh, so forth, none of that's going to make up for the crime that I did. That doesn't please you. I can put on all these airs and quote, follow the law and do all the things. Oh, I, I sinned, so I'm going to do this. Or I did this, and so I'll do this. I'll, I'll make up for it by my own power or through my own might. God will never be pleased with that. The reality is what really will mark a difference in the view of God, in the mind of God, or in the spirit of God, is that when you recognize the error, you, you go unto God and you cry unto God with a pure heart, a contrite and broken heart. When you, Broken heart is very important. Why do I say broken? Because we understand that the heart is, is, is very deceptive. And as uh, Jeremiah says, desperately wicked, wicked. The heart is very, very deceptive. It, it is very wily. And to be very careful about listening to your own heart's feelings. Or oh, wasn't it David's heart that said, I need to go see who this woman is that I'm looking at in the window? Uh, that's what's his heart. Oh, who is this lady? It was Bathsheba. That's who it was. Well, his heart says, ooh, I like her. Ooh, I love her. Ooh, I got to have her. That was his heart. The heart is deceptive. The heart should not be trusted. You know, one of the things that is very notable in the cultural uh, environment we have is that there's always this message about follow your heart. What does your heart say? That is of the devil. That's not of God. That's not of God. That's of the devil. Follow your heart will lead you to destruction. For the heart is 
deceptive. And as the scripture says, desperately wicked in Jeremiah, desperately wicked. Be careful of following your heart. No, follow the word of God. Follow God's Holy Spirit, not your heart. So a broken, break it down, stop it, and contrite, humbled heart. A broken and contrite heart is what God does take pleasure in. It's not my righteousness. It wasn't my goodness. It was God's grace that caused me to be saved. It's God's grace that opened up my mind to the reality of the truth because I couldn't figure it out on my own. It was God's grace that stopped me when I was about to do something ridiculous and wicked. It was God's grace, and it is God's grace, that keeps me from stumbling and falling even now. I thank God for it, and that's what we must do as well. So I pray this is a blessing you as well, and his grace will uh, benefit you as we move through this aspect as well in the area of the grace and the law. And we'll do more uh, later as God's will, okay? So God bless you all. Peace of God be with you. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Let it bring forth life and greater understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>